The uh, scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. And it reads, Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We're con- we are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Please be seated. Well, I'm very happy to be with you today. Thank you, Jonathan, for leading us in those beautiful songs and for your very fine participation in that singing. It's very uplifting, and the sentiments of the song are very encouraging for the prayers that have been offered. We're very grateful for those in the Scripture reading, and we're ready now to enter into this portion of our worship service. Uh, more will be said about this, I know, as time goes along, but be sure to take one of the brochures, which uh, serves a dual purpose. The brochure... Uh, lets people know what our program is about and what our plan is, but then it also uh, lays out the format of our Searching the Scriptures forum, and so this is the format that we will follow each evening, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and then of course this year we've added another dimension to that. Our young people will have a special program and a special speaker uh, immediately before our evening services on Monday, and we look forward to that, and I hope that... uh, uh, many of our young people in the area will be with us, and I encourage you to come and be with us as well. Then tonight, Brother Sam Wilcutt from Bossier City, Louisiana, will be speaking to us, and we're very happy that Sam is coming. He's a very fine young gospel preacher, and we're very grateful for his uh, presence and his presence on the forum and also for tonight. And I encourage you to come be with us tonight at 6 o'clock. And, uh, be acquainted and with this uh, gospel preacher and with these men who will be with us. Brother Roger, Brother Johnson was with us uh, last year, Robert Johnson, and uh, Brother Chris Grota will be with us uh, this year. He's also new to our forum, and so I think it'll add a lot to our discussion and our study. And uh, let me just say in the very beginning, and you'll hear me say this more than once, I'm so grateful for this fine congregation who is so supportive of this uh, work. Without you, it wouldn't be possible. Without the good elders here overseeing this matter, it wouldn't be possible. And all of these good deacons who see to the details and that kind of thing make this thing happen, and, and it all happens very well, and everything happens on time. And that's because a lot of people put a lot of their work and effort into this. And let me say I'm very grateful for each and every one of you and all of the many tasks that are done to bring this about. We'll have visitors from other congregations. We look forward to that. We look forward to your participation. And I really anticipate a great opportunity to come and study these great questions from the Bible. The only stipulation that I ever ask any speaker or anyone that I'm studying with is whatever the Bible says is right, and that's what we're going to go by. The New Testament is the truth. We're going to be judged by it. And whatever it says is what we'll apply to our lives, and we're going to work at that and do it properly. So let's come together tonight at 6, and then each evening, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7. And when these announcements are made at the conclusion of our worship today, please listen carefully to the announcements and cooperate as much as you possibly can. I want to talk about this subject today. It's been on my mind for some time. Uh, I want to talk about our responsibility to the local congregation. And you don't hear much about this particular matter, but it's one that surely the Bible does discuss. And I'll try to be brief and succinct in everything that I say so that we will really get the point and understand what the Word of God has to say in this particular matter. One thing we have to admit, and as we study the Bible, we grow in our appreciation and respect for, and that is how much the church means to God and to Jesus Christ. Uh, So much of the Bible, both in the Old Testament and especially in the New, are devoted to this wonderful subject of the church or the kingdom of Christ. And we'd really be remiss in our responsibility if we didn't turn to these passages and understand them as best we possibly can. 
just how much the church means to God, how much the church means to Christ. We read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a great passage that talks about the judgment, that we're going to stand before God in judgment. Let's read a passage or two about how much God loves the church and how important the church really is. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm thinking about verse 22, beginning there in that paragraph, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. He's the Savior of the church. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives sub should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. What a great admonition that is. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. What a great passage to help us understand the love of God for his church. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And that is verse 27. Acts chapter 20 and 28 is a very familiar passage to us where Paul, discussing these matters to the Ephesian elders, talks about the church being established and purchased with the blood, the very blood of Jesus Christ. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made your overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. It belongs to God. It belongs to Christ, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 is a passage we dare not forget, which talks about the great importance of the church in the mind of God. Therefore, he says, I hope to come to you soon, verse 14, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. What a great passage about the church of the New Testament. And the points that I'm making for the present as a means of introduction is the fact that the church of the Lord was so important to Christ that he actually gave his life for it. The church of the Lord so important to God that he actually gave his son for it. We have to ask ourselves the question, just how important is the Lord's church to me? One thing we're going to have to admit, though, the Lord's church is not going to be any stronger spiritually than its members. If the members are weak, the church is going to be weak. Just how strong is the congregation? The stronger the members, the stronger the congregation is going to be. If the members are weak and ineffective, if the members do not have a love and a desire for the church of the Lord, then naturally the church itself, which makes up the members, is not going to be as effective. The church is not going to be as strong as it really ought to be. If we are weak members, we are making up a weak congregation. But if we are strong in faith and are strong and diligent in our work, then we will make up a strong congregation. And the community will know. The community will be able to determine that is a weak congregation. They never do anything. They're never involved in anything. You never see them working in the community. They never work among themselves. The converse is also true. A congregation can be known in the community that is a city set on a hill, a light that gives forth to the community because they're strong members of the body of Christ. And they love the church as much as humanly possible. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. God loves the church and gave his son for it, the people of God. Therefore, these people grow in faith. They study the word of God. They love God and they love one another. And that can be seen throughout the community. If... We're the kind of congregation that is weak in faith. It naturally means we're a weak congregation. If we're going to be strong in faith, taking God at his word, applying it to our lives in every possible situation, then indeed a strong congregation will ensue. And I have to ask myself the question, you know, how much am I involved in this work? How strong am I making this church? If everyone were like me in faith, how strong would the congregation be? 
One of my favorite uh, methods and modes of entertainment naturally would be uh, uh, the TV, the movies, whereby uh, they're talking about or showing some kind of Western motif where the in Indians are attacking the fort and the um, cavalry comes to help out the settlers and that kind of Western really excites me for some reason and I grew up watching that and I just uh, enjoy watching it even for the present. That Western kind of show uh, back in the day when they would show uh, the great uh, West and the Western culture and the Western frontier just as an exciting type of entertainment that I enjoy watching. But it occurred to me some time ago that that's much like the church and it could be illustra illustrative of the church of the Lord. As long as the Indians were on the reservation, then nobody cared much about them. As long as they stayed on their place and didn't get off and didn't get out, then the cavalry was no need to monitor them and see to them and force them on their place. But once the Indians got off the reservation, then the action got started, and the cavalry would come out and try to contain them. Or if they got out and started doing something, the settlers would be upset and want the Indians back in their place and call upon the cavalry to do that. Is that not like the church of the Lord? If Satan can keep us in our place, if he can keep us within the confines of the walls, then nobody really cares. He doesn't, he's not concerned. The community will have no real interest or care or concern for us. However, when a strong congregation made up of strong members of faith decide we're going to get out of our walls, we're going to get out in the street, we're going to get out in the community, we're going to show these people what the Word of God says, we're going to convince them as best we possibly can, then Satan is concerned. And then the community, many in the community will say no to that, and they'll be concerned and they'll beg for help. Because now the truth of God's words on the march and it's going out there and it's going to be heard by people who otherwise would not hear it. If he keeps us within the confines of our walls, then nobody really cares. Nobody's going to be upset. If we get our message out there though, as we should, as a strong congregation, then people are going to take notice. What is my responsibility with regard to the church. Well, I've spoken a little bit about how important the church is to God and to Christ. I've spoken a little bit about how important the church is to the New Testament apostles. I've spoken a little bit with regard to our desire as to it being important to us. Now let's get down to brass tacks and let's talk about specifically what is my responsibility to the church of the Lord. My responsibility is to give the best I have. And sometimes we think about, well, give our money. And the Bible is very clear with regard to that responsibility. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, along with various Bible passages, talk about the importance of giving as we've been prospered. For God loves a cheerful giver. But does it not also talk about giving our time to the church of the Lord? Does it not also talk about giving our talent to the church of the Lord. Sometimes we may think, when I put a check in that plate, and please do not misunderstand me, we have a responsibility there, brethren, to give as we've been prospered, because that's what the Bible says. That's the obligation that's been given to us. That's our duty. To, and we have a great responsibility to live up to that. But sometimes when we do that, we think, that's the end of my responsibility. That's the end of my obligations. I have given of my means, and therefore I have no further obligation with regard to the church. But my responsibility to the church of the living God is to give the best that I have. And that would also include not only the funds that God has generously provided, but also my abilities, my talents, and my time. And sometimes we're a little short on that. We think, well, I've given of my financial means, therefore I have no further responsibility. But when you talk about giving, you really need to wrap up into that, this matter, not only of financial responsibility, but also my responsibility as far as my time is concerned. Responsibility as far as my talent is concerned, because they're all joined together. God has given me certain talents. He's given you certain talents. 
And these particular talents, of course, we simply should use in the work of the Lord. If we fail in that regard, then we're failing in our responsibility before God. And that's why I selected this particular passage for uh, study today. But I'd like to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, particularly verse 7, there the Apostle Paul talking about the suffering of Macedonian Christians and how dedicated they were to the cause of Christ. And as I said in chapter 8 and chapter 9, he's talking about financial support there, but he also makes a more fundamental point motivating them But as you excel in everything, verse 7, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Now his point in verse 7 is, of course, the matter of the giving of the financial means. That was necessary. That was needed. And there was a a need that was arising, and he's encouraging them to fulfill the need, financially speaking. But he said, don't let it stop there. Don't let it stop there. But you also excel in faith and excel in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness. And in our love for you, and then he goes on to make his present point, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Their giving was described as an act of grace and something that was very important with regard to their work and to their worship. My financial giving is an important part of it. But so is my time, and so is my talent. In this, I must excel also. 2 Corinthians 8 and the verses, verse 7. My talents, I must excel in that also. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verses, verse 7. I have a responsibility to give of my means, but my responsibility does not end there. My responsibility also includes my time, and my talent. And I've got to give a very serious, thoughtful consideration to my responsibility to the local congregation of which I'm a part. What is my responsibility? To give the best that I have. To live the best that we can. That's one of the great responsibilities that I have and that I should be discharging before the church of the living God. I'm to be an example of godly living. The Apostle Paul is facing some serious problems and error in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I, I thought of this particular passage when I was thinking of this point, and the verse that I have in mind is verse 34. And in verse 34, he says, Now, there are some problems with regard to this matter of the resurrection that you don't understand. And he clears up a lot of that misunderstanding. But I think the point that he makes in verse 34 could be applied to us all, and we need to take notice of it. So I'm in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm in verse 34. I'm talking about godly living now as my responsibility to the church to be an example to others. And he uses some strong language with regard to the matter. So I caution you, listen carefully. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. The words of the Apostle Paul. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Now, he's talking to the church at Corinth there, and he's talking about a problem that they were facing. And you and I have spent some special time studying that chapter. We spent some special time studying about the matter of the resurrection of the dead, how that God is going to raise the dead, and the spiritual body will come forth from the grave to be united with the soul, and there we will be with the Lord forever and ever. But he makes a very important point here that we need to consider. The point I'm saying in verse 34 is, Wake up. Now, 
Wake up from what? I think the church at Corinth was kind of in the doldrums, at least some of them. Uh, have you ever uh, done something with such rapidity that, you know, you just kind of go through the motions? And you might even think, well, did I do that already? Or do I need to go back and do that? I've done that with such habit that I can't remember where I did it or not. And, and I have to sometimes stop and think, am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And I guess all of us have experienced that at one time or another about certain things, whether it's driving or taking our vitamins in the morning. Did I do that today or not? Did I take my medication today or not? I have to stop and think about whether I did that. I do that with such rapidity and it's such a habit, I do it without thinking. And that's the point Paul's making. Don't go through this without thinking. Wake up. Wake up and recognize your responsibility to the congregation, to the church of God. And one of the great responsibilities that an individual has is to live the Christian life. Turn with me to one of my favorite books of the Bible. It is the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation, you see there a, an image of Christ. And John, by Revelation, sees this great vision, and he records it as best a human being can record it by inspiration for future generations to learn and read. And he comes to Revelation 1, and he's in verse 12, and it's a vision of Christ. But I want you to notice how he describes him here. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. That's verse 12. And on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Verse 15. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a fire. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. I love that description and depiction. And I love talking about the certain elements. But notice where he's found. He's found within the seven golden lampstands. The seven golden lampstands, as we understand them, refer to the churches that will be described in future chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3. These particular lampstands and the light that came from those lampstands represented people, congregations. Congregations of people. There would be the church at Ephesus, chapter 2, and the church at Smyrna, also chapter 2, and Pergamum and Thyatira, and on through the seven churches of Asia. There these particular matters were discussed to each congregation. And each of these congregations was running the risk of losing the lamp from the lampstand. Each one was running the risk of the Savior removing the light, removing the candlestick from the lampstand. The church, they were having problems. Problems at Ephesus, problems at Thyatira, at Pergamum. You and I have talked in time past about these great seven congregations. And when one studies them carefully, one can see oneself mirrored in part or in whole in some of these congregations. Even though they were congregations of the Lord a long time ago, if we're careful, we can see some of the same shortcomings. Maybe we can see some of their strengths in us. Maybe we can see some of their deficiencies in ourselves. And they serve as a great mirror for our souls. The point of the matter was they were in jeopardy of the lampstand being removed. They were bringing reproach upon the church because of this or because of that. And with each congregation was a different problem and a different perspective was being given. 
Their lives were not in accordance with the Word of God. And one time Jesus would say through John, Now go back to your first love and see it the way you had it then, when you first obeyed the gospel and how enthusiastic you were back then. See it that way and feel about it that way like you did back then and recapture that first love. Or to some of them he would say, Well now, you're spiritually blind and you don't realize it. And he's talking about their spiritual lives. And in effect, he's trying to say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Wake up and live the kind of life that God wants you to live before it is too late. You see, I have a responsibility here. I have a responsibility to the church to give it the best life that I can live. Nobody respects a congregation where the people don't live the message that they teach, it brings reproach upon the church. Therefore, I owe the church a godly Christian life so that I will be able to have the right kind of influence and the lamp will not be taken from the lampstand by the Savior. Responsibility that I have as a member of the church of the Lord is to follow those who lead. The congregation has told us that they have accepted these leaders, these elders of the congregation. These men have qualified themselves according to scripture qualifications that are given in 1 Timothy, also in the book of Titus. And now we have a responsibility to follow them, their leadership. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, this is one of the obligations I have as a member of the congregation. 1 Timothy 5 and 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And he's telling us of the responsibility which we have to respect them and to follow their leadership in matters of spiritual nature and expediency. In Hebrews chapter 13, I think every commentary, and I think I've read every one out there, there might be a commentary I haven't read on this book, but if it is, I'll soon make that correction and read it. But I think everyone that I've ever read through the years looks at first, uh, Hebrews 13, 17 as the elders of the local congregation. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. What is my responsibility in this matter? Responsibility in this matter is to follow the leaders spiritually. Leaders following matters, uh, decided matters of expediency, carrying out the divine will of God. God's given us the word. The Lord has given us the law. And now we must follow it. And elders, by means of expedient decisions, see to it that that word is being carried out. And that that's being done in the local congregation. 1 Peter chapter 5 is another great chapter. I always think about that when I think about the need for the local congregation. And encouraging the local congregation to follow the oversight of its elders. Now brethren, that's just as much a part of God's divine pattern for the church as the singing we did today. The congregation following the spiritual leadership of its elders. Just as much a part of God's divine pattern for the church as the Lord's Supper that we observe today. This matter of following the leadership of the body of Christ, the elders who have qualified themselves, leading faithfully the word of God in matters of expediency, just as much a part of God's divine pattern for the New Testament church as being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. What do I owe as far as my responsibility to the local congregation? I owe them my fellowship in matters of expediency. What is my attitude in this regard? Submissiveness, eager cooperation, support, or... Is my attitude a criticizing one, a grumbling one, a resentful one, whereby we're complaining about this one, complaining about that one, complaining about this particular matter or the other? 
My responsibility to the church, that's what I want to know. I want to know what is my responsibility to the local congregation of God's people. I owe them my fellowship. And brethren, when you have a strong pulpit, and you have strong elders, and you have a strong fellowship, you will have a strong congregation that belongs to Jesus Christ. Not only is it a matter of me to give the best that I have, whether it be financial, time, or talent. Not only is it a matter for me to live the best way I can as a Christian ought to live, as outlined before me in the pages of the Bible. It is a matter of me to follow those who give the lead in matters of expediency, carrying out the will of Christ as it is given to us in the pages of the New Testament. But what do I owe the local congregation to develop the right attitude. What is the attitude that I have toward the local congregation? What is my attitude toward the church? Should we not examine that personally and carefully? Let me examine an attitude or two that I may mention. And let me uh, do that by looking at a man's attitude toward the church. It's found for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I have to say, I, I admire this man so much. I've studied him for so many years. And those of you who know the Scriptures know that I'm referring to the Apostle Paul. I know he's not Jesus Christ the righteous, but he is a man of great inspiration of God and uh, great dedication and focus. And I really admire that in him. But let me take just a brief moment. A brief moment's all I have to examine a man's attitude. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, and the verse that I have in mind, verse 9 and verse 10. This is what he gave the local congregation. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. That's who the church belongs to. It belongs to God, it's his. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now the word that comes to my mind when I read a statement like that man's attitude, the statement or the word is grateful. This man, is grateful. This man is filled with gratitude about what? Being a child of God and being given the work of God. This man is filled with gratitude about what? The fact that God has given him the task to do. I'm so grateful. I wasn't worthy of it. Why I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and we just don't have time to illustrate the point that he's making there. Why he would persecute Christians. His hatred for the church was second to none. But what is his attitude now that he's been obedient to the gospel of Christ? I'm grateful for your grace. And I'm thankful you gave me this job to do. That's the attitude he has developed. What do I owe the church of the Lord? I owe the church of of the Lord, the development of the proper attitude. Lord, I'm grateful for the work you've given me to do. I'm thankful for the task at hand. You've opened up a door of opportunity, a window whereby we have an opportunity to let others see Christ living in us. Let's go through that door. Let's walk through it and let people see just how great God is and how great Christ is, and that He suffered and died, and as we sang, rose from the dead for God's glory and our salvation. That's the attitude that I should have. I tell you, brethren, I've been in certain parts of the world, and they don't have the benefits we've got here. I've been in certain parts of the United States, and they don't have the benefits that we have here. Let's develop the right attitude. Have I got a responsibility here to the local congregation? You bet I do. I got an, a responsibility with regard to my time, my talent, my money. 
I got a responsibility to live Christ every single day, to live like His child as the Bible describes. I've got a responsibility to follow the leadership. I've got a responsibility to develop the right attitude about my work and my responsibility to the Lord. Is there some correction that needs to be made here today? Is there some opportunity for you to use your life for the master in the proper way? First thing you need to do is to obey the gospel of Christ and become a child of God. That by repenting of sin and confessing your faith, committing your life to Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And then living the faithful Christian life every day thereafter, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Now, I've spent my time today talking about the churches, my responsibility to the church. But let me ask you this question. Does the church have the responsibility to me? Yes, it does. And I'll talk about that, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. If you're not a child of God today, won't you become one? Won't you come? While together we stand and while we sing.